The next night I went tearing into Paris with as much gold as I could carry. The sun had just sunk beneath the horizon when I opened my eyes, and a clear azure light still emanated from the sky as I mounted and rode off to the city. I was starving, and as luck would have it I was attacked by a cutthroat before I ever reached the city walls. He came thundering out of the woods, pistol blazing, and I actually saw the ball leave the barrel of the gun and go past me as I leapt off my horse and went at him. He was a powerful man, and I was astonished at how much I enjoyed his cursing and struggling. The vicious servant I'd taken last night had been old. This was a hard young body. Even the roughness of his badly shaven beard tantalized me, and I loved the strength in his hands as he struck at me. But it was no sport. He froze as I sank my teeth into the artery, and when the blood came it was pure voluptuousness. In fact, it was so exquisite that I forgot completely about drawing away before the heart stopped. We were on our knees in the snow together, and it was a wallop, the life going into me with the blood. I couldn't move for a long moment. Hmm. Broke the rules already, I thought. Am I supposed to die now? Doesn't look like that is going to happen. Just this rolling delirium, and the poor dead bastard in my arms, who would have blown my face off with his pistol if I had let him. I kept staring at the darkening sky, at the great spangled mass of shadows ahead that was Paris, and there was only this warmth after an obviously increasing strength. So far, so good. I climbed to my feet and wiped my lips, then I pitched the body as far as I could across the unbroken snow. I was more powerful than ever, and for a little while I stood there feeling gluttonous and murderous, just wanting to kill again so this ecstasy would go on forever. But I couldn't have drunk any more blood, and gradually I grew calm and changed somewhat. A desolate feeling came over me, an aloneness as though the thief had been a friend to me, or kin to me, and had deserted me. I couldn't understand it except that the drinking had been so intimate. His scent was on me now, and I sort of liked it, but there he lay yards away on the crumpled crust of the snow, hands and face looking grey under the rising moon. Hell, the son of a bitch was going to kill me, wasn't he? Within an hour I had found a capable attorney, name of Pierre Roger, at his home in the Marais, an ambitious young man with a mind that was completely open to me, greedy, clever, conscientious, exactly what I wanted. Not only could I read his thoughts when he wasn't talking, but he believed everything I told him. He was most eager to be of service to the husband of an heiress from Saint-Domingue, and certainly he would put out all the candles, save one if my eyes were still hurting. From tropical fever, as for my fortune in gems, he dealt with the most reputable jewelers, bank accounts and letters of exchange for my family in the Auvergne, yes, immediately. This was easier than playing Lelio, but I was having a hell of a time concentrating. Everything was a distraction, the smoky flame of the candle on the brass inkstand, the gilded pattern of the Chinese wallpaper, and Monsieur Roger's amazing little face, with its eyes glistening behind tiny octagonal spectacles. His teeth kept making me think of clavier keys, ordinary objects in the room appeared to dance. A chest stared at me with its brass knobs for eyes, and a woman singing in an upstairs room over the low rumble of a stove seemed to be saying something in a low and vibrant secret language, such as, come to me. But it was going to be this way forever, apparently, and I had to get myself in hand. Money must be sent by courier this very night to my father and my brothers, and to Nicolas de l'Enfant, a musician with Renault's House of Thespians, who was to be told only that the wealth had come from his friend Lestat de Lioncourt. It was Lestat de Lioncourt's wish that Nicolas de l'Enfant move at once to a decent flat on the Saint-Louis or some other proper place, and Roger should, of course, assist in this, and thereafter, Nicolas de l'Enfant should study the violin. Roger should buy for Nicolas de l'Enfant the best available violin, a Stradivarius, and finally, a separate letter was to be written to my mother, the Marquise, Gabrielle de Lioncourt, in Italian, so that no one else could read it, and a special purse was to be sent to her. If she could undertake a journey to southern Italy, the place where she had been born, maybe she could stop the course of her consumption. It made me positively dizzy to think of her with the freedom to escape. I wondered what she would think about it. For a long moment, I didn't hear anything Roger said. I was picturing her dressed for once in her life as the Marquise she was, and riding out of the gates of our castle in her own coach. 
and six, and then I remembered her ravaged face and heard the cough in her lungs as if she were here with me. Send the letter and the money to her tonight, I said. I don't care what it costs. Do it. I laid down enough gold to keep her in comfort for a lifetime, if she had a lifetime. Now, I said, do you know of a merchant who deals in fine furnishings, paintings, tapestries? Someone who might open his shops and storehouses to us this very evening. Of course, monsieur. Allow me to get my coat. We shall go immediately. We were headed for the Faubourg Saint-Denis within minutes, and for hours after that, I roamed with my mortal attendants through a paradise of material wealth, claiming everything that I wanted. Couches and chairs, china and silver plate, drapery and statuary, all things were mine for the taking. And in my mind, I transformed the castle where I'd grown up as more and more goods were carried out to be created and shipped south immediately. To my little nieces and nephews, I sent toys of which they'd never dreamed, tiny ships with real sails, dollhouses of unbelievable craft and perfection. I learned from each thing that I touched, and there were moments when all the color and texture became too lustrous, too overpowering. I wept inwardly. I would have got away with playing human to the hilt during all this time, except for one very unfortunate mishap. At one point, as we wandered through the warehouse, a rat appeared as bold city rats will, racing along the wall very close to us. I stared at it, nothing unusual, of course, but there, amid plaster and hardwood and embroidered cloth, the rat looked marvelously particular. And the men, misunderstanding, of course, began mumbling frantic apologies for the rat and stamping their feet to drive it away from us. To me, their voices became a mixture of sounds like stew bubbling in a pot. All I could think was that the rat had very tiny feet, and that I had not yet examined a rat nor any small, warm-blooded creature. I went and caught the rat rather too easily, I think, and looked at its feet. I wanted to see what kind of little toenails it had and what was the flesh like between its little toes, and I forgot the men entirely. It was their sudden silence that brought me back to myself. They were both staring dumbfounded at me. I smiled at them as innocently as I could, let the rat go, and went back to purchasing. Well, they never said anything about it. But there was a lesson in this. I had really frightened them. Later that night, I gave my lawyer one last commission. He must send a present of 100 crowns to a theater, owned by the name of Renault, with a note of thanks from me for his kindness. Find out the situation with this little playhouse, I said. Find out if... There are any debts against it. Of course, I'd never go near the theater. They must never guess what had happened, never be contaminated by it. And for now, I had done what I could for all those I loved, hadn't I? And when all this was finished, when the church clock struck three over the white rooftops and I was hungry enough to smell blood everywhere, that I turned, I found myself standing in the empty boulevard du Temple. The dirty snow had turned to slush under the carriage wheels, and I was looking at the house of thespians, with its spattered walls and its torn playbills, and the name of the young mortal actor Lestat de Voilois, still written there in red letters.